Welcome to our classroom. In this space, we talk about education, which is inclusive of, but not limited to, what happens in schools. Education is taking place whenever and wherever we are willing to learn. Peace, y'all. Roberto Germán from Multicultural Classroom. Glad you can join me this evening. Welcome, welcome, welcome. This evening, we are going to be talking about Black and Brown Founders Organization and the Chroma 2022 event. Conversations, connections, capital. It's going down from October 14th to the 16th. So y'all got to get with it. It's a virtual conference, an online community presented by Black and Brown Founders. And this evening, I'm going to have Dal uh, Medina, who's going to be joining us to share more about Black and Brown Founders, share more about Chroma 2022. And so I'm excited. A very, very knowledgeable individual moving about in the business space, doing incredible things. Del Medina, con nosotros esta noche. Gracias, Del, por tu presencia. No, gracias a ti. Gracias, gracias. And why don't we start by you just sharing uh, your name, your location, and a little bit about your association with Black and Brown Founders. Mm -hmm. Well, first of all, thank you, Roberto, for that amazing uh, introduction. I feel all hyped up. I'm really excited to talk to you about that. My name is Del Del Medina, and I am the executive director of Black and Brown Founders. We're going to be having Chroma 2021 that's happening this Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. Uh, if you watch it live, it's free. Uh, what we're going to be doing is bringing you the best on our, our virtual stage that talks about how do you think about creating a business? right? And how to use technology to do that, right? Like to me, technology is one tool, like we're having a conversation right now, thanks to some folks that built some technology, right? Uh, but that's not the only way of doing that. And that there's ways in which now that, if anything, the pandemic has taught us that technology has allowed us to keep in contact and to keep in touch. Um, and how you use that during your business uh, every day is an important part of the work. So I'm excited that you and the uh, Lorena, fantastic Lorena, are going to be a part of it uh, and are going to be presenting as well. Uh, we have 20 odd speakers that are going to be talking over three days. Uh, but for us at Black and Brown Founders, it's about saying, hey, if you're going to create a business, how do you create it in a way that makes sense for you as a human being coming from the communities that we come from rather than try to follow the footsteps or try to follow uh a roadmap that wasn't really created for us, right? And so often when people are thinking about founders, they're thinking about a white guy with a hoodie, and that is actually the furthest thing from who we are as human beings, but more importantly, the experiences that we have and the problems and solutions that we're trying to, you know, address. All right, there you are. I, I love what y'all are doing, and I have a number of, of questions as it relates to, to business, business practices. But yeah. first, back up. Yeah. How do you spell your name? Just so, so the public know. <laughs> now, how do you spell your name? And, and give us a little bit of history behind your name. Because I, yeah. I know P is solid, and I think it throws some people off. But I think that's a, a fun question for, to, for you to share with the public. Yeah, so my name is Del Del Medina. It's spelled D-E-L-D-E-L-P. The P is silent. Um, my mother's name is Delfina. And so my parents invented a name. Uh, and that's the invention that you got. So that's what happens when you have a writer and a painter get together in the 70s and have a baby. Uh, you end up with a name like Del Del Medina. You are one of a kind. Yes. <laughs> it's personal it. branding before there was personal branding. <laughs> so tell us a little bit about uh, your, your background. How do you mm -hmm. identify, um, you know, what attracted you to black and brown founders? Yep. And maybe a little bit, not maybe, you know, part of what I do is education. So I need to hear a little bit about your education journey. Yeah, no, it's interesting you should say that. Um, putting it from a perspective of education, um, I come from, hard, you know, uh, 
very well educated people that come from working class backgrounds. Uh, from the United from, if, no, from Colombia. My family's from Colombia. Uh, I grew up here and I grew up in Colombia. I went back and forth as a child. Um, I was very lucky to do so um, and to be able to be educated in both public and private schools. Uh, in both Barranquilla? In Barranquilla, yeah, in Barranquilla. Um, and, um, and so I've always approached education and learning as a lifelong pursuit not something that you went and you got a degree because that's what I saw the adults in my life doing around me, which was constantly reading things, going to museums, having conversations, being in community, uh, seeing live music, seeing, mu you know, watching movies, just always being in the mix is the way that I think about it. And I was very lucky to have grown up that way. Um, and that just made me, I'm a very curious person by nature, but I think that being in a family like that allowed me to nurture my curiosity. Mm -hmm. um, and so one of the curiosities that I had was technology. So I was the first girl uh, in the computer science uh, kind of club, after school club that we had at Alvarado Elementary School here in San Francisco, California. Um, I then bought my first computer at the age of uh, 16. And at the time, the computer cost as much as a used car. And all my friends thought I was nuts for buying it. They were like, where are you spending that money? You could be buying a car. And I was like, why would I want a car? I want a computer. Um, and that computer actually trained me and one of my younger siblings um, and uh, allowed him to have access to early technology as well. Um, and then when I was 18, 19, I went and worked at a bulletin board service, uh, which is like a pre-internet, uh, closed looped internet. Um, and then I went on to become a dot comer. So I've always had an interest in, um, in technology. Uh, I always had an interest in learning about it, but nowhere along the line that anybody say to me, go study computer science. Nowhere along the line that somebody say, Hey, you seem really interested with these things. Uh, here's a path for it. I just happened to be doing these things with friends uh, on the weekends and after school and just kind of an interest that I had using technology, you know, really to, to study the humanities uh, or bringing in that kind of lens uh, to any of the other things that I would do. So, for example, I once got hired to be a grant writer. I am a terrible grant writer. Please don't hire me for that. But what I ended up doing was actually working with somebody and getting all the IT redone for this nonprofit that I worked at. Um, it just would be that sort of thing time and time again. I would get hired for doing one particular kind of job and then end up somehow like being tech adjacent in, you know, a smaller organization uh, because they didn't have somebody who understood certain things. And so like I would be the person that would like try to figure things out. Um, I think like that's kind of like the puzzle kind of part of my brain of like I like puzzles and I'm like, oh, how do you how do you do this? How do you put this all together? Right. Um, so that's my background. Um, and how do I identify? I think like this, as we're ending, uh, you know, uh, Latino, Latinx, Hispanic Heritage Month, you know, I've been really grappling with this question this year in a way that I think is different. Um, I have suggested that perhaps we have uh, an acronym like LGBTQIA that acknowledges that people are on a spectrum of uh, who they are and how they identify uh, within a community, because I think that What's been disheartening to me during this month in particular is to see these arguments about what we call ourselves mm. when I could care less. <laughs> I was like, are we in partnership with each other? Are we in community with each other? Are we engaging with each other? Are we uplifting each other? Are we trying to dismantle some systems that are oppressive? Like, are we going to do this together? Like, those are the things that interest me and I think are more important then how do I identify or how does somebody else identify and why do they use this versus the other? Like, I'm like, I don't care what you call yourself. Um, are we, can we be in community with each other in mutually respectful ways? Like that's, what's important to me. Mm -hmm. I happen to identify as Latinx um, and, uh, because I think it's important uh, to be gender inclusive. Um, I also think sometimes leadership comes from people who are younger than you. Uh, who are looking to expand definitions and the way that we see things. Um, and so while generationally speaking, I do not fit into that box. I do think that from a, um, what's the right word that I'm looking for? From a philosophical perspective, I think Latinx suits me, uh, but I am not offended if other people identify in different ways. Thank you. Thank you for sharing. 
a um, number of things that you said there that I, I want to kind of circle back to. One, one point was about uh, your curiosity and fostering your curiosity, uh, which is awesome. I, I always uh, like to share um, a quote of a former colleague of mine, Dan Cummings, and, and that is that we want to lead with curiosity. Mm, and, yes. and part of what I extracted from what you were sharing is that, you know, your curiosity led you to delve into education outside of the four walls mm. of the school. It was like, all right, you're interested in computers. And, you know, it, it didn't have to happen um, by a teacher telling you that this is what you mm. have to do or, or it being in a particular class or whatnot is that we, you were feeding that mm -hmm. natural curiosity, which is part of what yeah. we want to encourage. Um, and so I, I want to connect that now to what you're doing with Black and Brown Founders and with the Chroma Conference. Um, you had mentioned that this conference is individuals uh, who think about starting a business or whatnot. Uh, mm -hmm. But what about folks who are not starting a business? What about folks who already have a business? And I know there's some people on the platform yeah. right now that have a business. Is this conference for them also, and if so, yeah. you know, how so? Yeah, no, I think it is. It's for, you know what, this is what I think is part of what leadership looks like, is always trying to think of new ways of doing things. I think that when I was younger and I would go and work for somebody else, what was frustrating for me is that people would be like, but this is the way we've always done it. And I'm like, but it's not always, it's not necessarily the best or most organized or there's better ways or there's new technology or there's new opportunities. And I think I want to welcome anybody who is currently, uh, you know, engaging in business practices to come and learn uh, new techniques and new opportunities for people. I think if the pandemic has taught us anything um, is that you have to be as flexible as possible. And that's where I saw last year, just a boon in creativity where people were like, what am I going to do? Like a week, we got so many folks who were like, I'm going to lose my business because the way that I've normally done it, I cannot do. I cannot be open the way that I've normally done it. Um, I've never had to be online. I've never had to like engage in these practices. So what am I supposed to do? Like lots of people got that phone call, right? Um, other people got the phone call of like, I was about to do X, Y, Z, and now I have to rethink my life completely. Like I know of someone who was given a job offer, moved to a new city, and then suddenly found themselves without a job because the pandemic happened. And so that's why this year for us at Chroma, the, the theme is creativity is resilience, because I saw so many people having to be creative to be able to find resilience. It's in that creativity that they found resilience. And I think that's so often resilience, and I go back and forth on this personally, to be honest, like resilience is also, um, it's a coping mechanism for oppression, right? Uh, and so when I think about that too, is that sometimes we don't wanna be resilient. Sometimes we wanna be vulnerable. Sometimes we ha wanna have a moment. Um, and so often folks that come from our backgrounds aren't allowed to have that. Mm -hmm. uh, you know. And so I struggle with that at the same time. And yet at the same time, I'm like, wow, we are so creative. Like you spend en enough time on this particular app and you're like, wow, people have come up with new dance styles, new hairdos, new ways of being, new ways of talking, new language. Like just you're like, wow, new ways of dressing, like new ways of adorning ourselves. Like these are things that we do constantly. Uh, we are culture creators. Um, and so I think that that creativity to me is something that is uniquely ours and it is a superpower um, to be creative in a moment of resilience like if you don't have shoes how do you learn to make shoes right um i've had family member that's like that of like oh we can't afford to buy blah 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 but we will make this at home and it will look just as good as anybody else's thing right um and i think that there's something beautiful in that so i'm that is the one thing that i asked the speakers is to think about creativity and to address creativity as resilience, because I think it's an important part of, of the realities that we've been living during the pandemic, before the pandemic, and after the pandemic. That's great, that's great. So for, <clears throat> for the individuals that uh, attend Chroma, what, yeah. what are you hoping that they get out of this conference? Oh, wow, you know, 
It's always great when you get, um, so here's a, here's a, a business tip that I'm going to give everybody. I think that data is really, really important. How you gather data and what kind of data you gather is, is important. What kind of mechanisms you put into place to gather that data is also important. So we always do a pre-event survey and then we do a post-event survey. And it's a way of us figuring out what do people need? What are they finding out? And so the post-event survey for us is important because it's also, um, the pre-event survey is important to us because it helps us mold and look at what are some of the holes, what are some of the needs that people have, how can we address these? Um, the post-event survey is important to us because then it tells us like, what do people get out of it? Um, and the number one thing that I think I always hear from people who come to our events is that they see themselves reflected. So often when people go to business conferences or tech conferences, uh, people don't look like us on the stages and they don't talk about their expertises, right? So, uh, so often folks, uh, you know, talk about diversity, equity, and inclusion. Uh, but when we have somebody that's going to come and talk about DEI, we're going to have somebody who's an expert in that field, right? Uh, versus someone who is like, I'm talking about this because nobody will actually engage me to talk about the thing that I'm professionally associated with, mm -hmm. right? Um, so people seeing themselves reflected is important. People making connections with each other is also important. Um, the other thing that people seem to just have given us feedback on is that they always learn something new and that they learn a new way of engaging with each other, um, and engaging in their business practices. And that to me is the most exciting thing uh, about like, oh, as a result of this, I thought about how to put together a different kind of product or a different kind of engagement or engage my customers in a different way. Like I hadn't thought about doing these things, but I, I watched just one thing and then I saw it. For example, uh, folks, um, you know, Perkins Coie is one of our sponsors and they're a legal firm. And so people have watched um, and have engaged with the content so that they can understand what are the legal needs that you have as a business owner. Mm -hmm. uh, the folks at, uh, at M12, which is Microsoft's venture arm and the folks at the African American and Black uh, Business Network are also sponsors, um, and they are also going to be on our virtual stage talking about, you know, how they engage in partnership because partnerships are a way of, of making money. And how do you set up those partnerships, and what does that mean? Um, and so it's, a, it's exciting to have folks that are uh, have smaller businesses, and it's exciting to talk to people who are large corporate partners. Um, but to see that all along the line, there's different ways in which you can be learning new things and new ways to engage your customers. That's great. That's great. Um, so opportunity for reflection, opportunity for connection, opportunity to learn something new. So education is happening and we should always be desiring to learn something new. So connections. Mm -hmm. will, will there be opportunities to network at the Chroma event? Yes, so we encourage people in our live chat to come in and engage each other, uh, meet each other, share, you know, any sort of handles that they have. Um, this is one of the things that made me the saddest, actually, during the pandemic is that, you know, before the pandemic, we could have in-person events and we actually, Chroma originally was intended to be a series of in-person events mm -hmm. last year. And then we very quickly had a pivot to be online. Um, and so it, I do miss being in a room with people, but I'm really excited to see um, how people connect with each other in the chat um, and engage with each other. Uh, we know that in the past, that sort of engagement has helped people find new customers, new, engage, you know, new ways of being with people, um, you know, whether it's like they got hired or recommended for a job or uh, somebody introduced them to an investor as a result of meeting. So I, I think it's just a a great opportunity and I'm really excited um, to be able to do that. But more importantly, this is the other thing that speaking of learning opportunities for us, like the thing that I learned last year is that we have an international audience. Mm -hmm. uh, we had some folks that joined us internationally that I did not expect to join us internationally. Uh, but that's one of the things that happened and that was really exciting. And so we look forward to having people uh, that are part of the diaspora and that are part of the conversation. Can you share some of the places that they'll be joining <laughs> Yeah, I know. Uh, we have folks in South Africa, in Ghana, Colombia. Hey! My phone keeps on falling. I'm sorry. Um, uh, Mexico, uh, England, Spain, so from all over the place. Yeah. Wow. 
That's great. And so for individuals who are listening now, if they wanted to participate in Chroma, can they participate? In, so how could they participate in Chroma 2022, 20, 21, excuse me? It's okay. It's your time traveling. I time travel all the time. Um, don't we want to, don't we want this year to end? I think that's part of what our brain is doing. Like we want 2021 to be done. Let's just get to the last year. Yeah, I know. <laughs> um, so there's several ways people can participate in Chroma. Number one, I know that you are going to be posting about it. They should follow through with your links, um, and sign up that way. Right. Uh, it, about it. Yes. So follow up with that link. Uh, it's really important. Um, it's, if you watch it live, it's free. If you want to buy a 30-day pass to wait, be able to wait, watch wait. Pause you, people. Did you hear that? If you watch it live, the Chroma 2021 event, it's free. <laughs> okay? I'm reiterating that because sometimes we make excuses about not getting certain things that we need. But mm -hmm. here we have an event that is free, resources available to you, experts coming to support you, those of you who want to build your business, or strengthen your business free if you join it virtually. All right? <laughs> so they're, they're making it happen. They are making this accessible, which is yeah. thing is important to us in multicultural classrooms. So again, yeah. free if you join virtually the Chroma 2021 event. Now, there is a paid piece to this, so you could go ahead and speak on that. Yeah, no, and it's just if you want to watch it on your own time, like it's it's uh, it's thirty nine dollars for the month, and you can watch it, and you can rewatch it. We've had people also buy the all access pass, which is ninety nine dollars, and lets you have three hundred and sixty five days worth of like watching the content. That's actually another learning thing that we had last year is that since this is the first time we've ever done a, a virtual only event. Um, how many people bought those passes and watched those sessions again and again and watched and decided, oh, I remember this was this one thing here with this one speaker. Let me go watch right. a video again. Um, and so that was a learning experience that we had because we've always just done in-person events and then we would have a live stream uh, and the people would come to the event, have a great time, you know, learn some new things, be able to do that, but they didn't have that option. And so I think, I think if anything, Roberto, you would know because as an educator, this whole idea of flipping the classroom has been really fascinating to me um, because I think when I think about it, like a professor or a teacher having to give the same lecture time and time again, right, over time through their, through their experience, how sometimes it's better for you to be able to be available to your students to answer questions, right? Um, um, and to have the video be the in, the thing that kids do at home, um, and then to have the interaction be the thing that happens in real life, um, and that's also made me think a lot about when you know we get to hang out with each other and have events in person again. How are we going to structure that as well? Um, so that's exciting to me too. Is that yes, you can you can buy this uh, pass and you can watch the content again. Um, you can keep on learning from it throughout the year. You could refer to it as needed. Um, or you can buy the 30-day pass and kind of watch it at your own leisure. And can you reiterate to the audience the fee for the passes? Yes, yeah, so it's $39 for the 30-day pass and $99 for the year. Okay. So again, folks, 30, 38? 39. 39. $39 <laughs> for 30-day pass? Yeah. All right. Hey, that's a pretty good deal, folks. I mean, I'm no mathematician, but that's like <laughs> an hour for a day. It is right. poeta. <laughs> and uh, for the year, and some of you, some of you, if you're like me, you might benefit from watching things a couple of times. Yeah. Zero, taking notes. Now, different people learn in different ways. So I'm yes. sure some of you can join virtually, well, on the days that is taking place October 14th through the, 6th, uh, through the 16th, 16th, and you'll get all the details down because your brain just absorbs everything. Mm -hmm. Wonderful, and that's fine. But others might need to watch this thing a couple times. And yes. so I want to challenge and encourage the audience, don't be afraid to invest in yourself. Don't be afraid to invest in your education. Don't be afraid to learn something new. And I know some of the folks that are joining us may not necessarily come from a business background, 
uh, maybe they haven't started a business yeah. or, or maybe they've been kind of playing with the idea. And so yeah. I, like I want to challenge and encourage folks not to be afraid to try on something new, to listen to something new. Maybe you don't end up starting a business. Starting a business not for everybody. Yeah. However, I do want to give you an opportunity, Del, to, to share with us why it is some folks should consider starting a business. <sighs> the list is long. How long do we have? <laughs> Here's what I would say. I think that we come from entrepreneurial people uh, because we've always had to make do with less to make more happen. Um, I think that so often we dismiss that as an actual skill set. Uh, we don't value it as much. Um, and that I think that part of our work at Black and Brown Founders is to actually like flip that script. Um, you don't know how many people I've had a conversation with who are like, oh, I don't know anything about technology or I don't know anything about business. And then like five seconds later, they're like, well, let me show you what I did uh, for this album for the quinceañera. And I'm like, you don't know anything about technology, but you just set up this whole online quinceañera album for somebody and, and, and you don't know anything about business, but somehow people end up commissioning you to do things all the time and you, you make cakes or you, you know, you're a DJ or, you know, it's not your full-time job, but this is the other thing that you would do on a side. So I think like that whole idea of a side hustle um, is not something to be dismissed. Um, and that it can be formalized to become a business in a way that actually nourishes you, not only because you enjoy doing that thing, but because it's going to actually bring in money that you can, you, you should be charging, right? And so that there is a difference between the folks out there who have a hobby and the folks who can create a business. Um, a hobby is something that you do for pleasure. It's something that you enjoy. A business is when you're actually selling some sort of product or service. Um, and I think that so often we don't know how to differentiate those things um, and that it's important to like acquire language around it so that you can actually have ownership of it. That's awesome. I want to go back to a term you mentioned earlier, which was partnership. Mm -hmm. And would love for you to share with us how you think we could be in partnership with black and brown founders or, you know, in partnership in general as, as a people, all right, as black and brown folks or, or just, you know, community in general. But obviously there's a focus here on black and brown folks based, you know, on, on yeah. the group that you're associated with and, and even the Chroma Conference, you know, if I understand this correctly, is really appealing to and, and, and trying to bring in black and brown folks to support them um, for all the reasons that we know, lack of opportunities, lack of resources, so on and so forth, uh, the need for representation and reflection, so on and so forth. Um, so what are some ways that you think that we could be in partnership? Well, I think in particular with you, Roberto, and the, you know, Lorena, the multicultural classroom, one of the things that's exciting to me to be in partnership with you uh, both is the work that you're doing um, as both a parent and someone that did go, like I said, to public schools here in the United States. It's important for me to be in partnership with people who are really looking to dismantle some systems of oppression at, at a very basic institution that we need. I mean, I think that What's been interesting to me during this whole pandemic of just like the conversations that we've had around education, right? Uh, I, I, and I just keep on thinking about this in particular of like, how is it that the system that we least invest in is the thing that actually is keeping together this economy, mm -hmm. right? Because if people couldn't send their kids to school, they, some people had to stop working. And there's been a whole bunch of women in particular who've had to take bear the brunt of that, of being able to say, I'm going to have to stay home and, and do this thing with my kid because I can't work and have, you know, my five-year-old, my six-year-old, my seven-year-old be on a computer. They just, we, we're not set up for that, right? Um, and it saddens me that, unfortunately, it took a pandemic for us to have these conversations about how important education is. So for me, a partnership um to be honest, is, is about starting a conversation and being able to elevate and give the virtual stage to folks such as yourselves who are doing the work, who have a unique perspective, uh, who are being successful at that work, 
and um, and have created a business out of the things that you know and the point of view that you have. Um, that success is to me just amazing. And I just just seeing how you guys went from an idea to where you are now, I'm I'm completely in awe, and I'm grateful that you are participating at Chroma this year. Um, and I think partnership looks different in different ways. Um, you know, it could be the sort of thing where you get to invite me on this IG live and we get to have this conversation. It could be that, you know, next thing I know, you're going to email me something and be like, Hey, you should check this out or vice versa, where I see an opportunity for you all. And I'm like, Hey, I think you guys would be great for this. Um, I would say like a big part of my job is actually sending out those emails. Uh, a big part of my job is seeing what opportunities are coming down, people getting in touch with us, and for us to being able to say, hey, here's here's an opportunity. Oh, yeah. Um, and for example, I got a I got an email uh, saying that there were, there was some institute that was looking for black owned businesses that specialize in sustainability. And if I knew anybody, and I was like, of course, I know like half a dozen people uh here are their names uh let me let me know if you want an introduction but here's their names and it makes me realize like a lot of people don't know black people who are in sustainability and they're they're supposed to be the experts in sustainability like i know nothing about sustainability i recycle i compost those are the things i do because those are things that my family's always done my family's always recycled always compost this is just a part of my growing up uh but I was just like in shock. I was like, here's this giant institution that is dedicated to this thing. And you're going to tell me you're not in relationship to people who are black, who are doing this work. And you're also acting as if that is not work that black people are interested in doing, which was, it's always like a surprise, but I'm always like, you know, that's the nature of white supremacy. There you go. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like keeping people apart, not acknowledging people for like their actual gifts uh, is, is a part of, it's you know it's it's a feature not a bug thank you for that thank you for that um and and we appreciate just having connected with you over the years and um just for us it's important to always be developing new relationships fostering those relationships um get an understanding of what people are doing in different spaces because we learn from that and we can grow from that so uh really appreciate you uh, looking forward to the Chroma event and how people respond to it. Once again, folks, Chroma 2021, Conversations, Connections, Capital, taking place from October 14th to October 16th. You can join virtually for free on those days, but if you want to go at your own pace, then you can certainly purchase passes either for the month or for the year, uh, okay. different fees for that. This is a virtual conference uh, in an online community presented by Black and Brown Founders in Del Medina <laughs> is here joining us. Del Del Medina has been here joining us to share uh, a bit about Black and Brown Founders, a bit about the Chroma Conference, uh, a bit about community and, and partnership and uh, all the things that are important to us as we continue to navigate through the society trying to create more opportunities, trying to learn from one another, grow with one another, okay. and hopefully advance with one another. Oof. So, Del, I really appreciate you. Uh, I'm, I'm excited about continuing to work with you, but also excited okay. about meeting different people that are going to come into this space, participate okay. in Roma, uh, maybe get involved with Black and Brown Founders. Uh, what? Is there a way for, for folks to get involved with Black and Brown Founders? Uh, yeah, you can, you, yeah, you can uh, follow us through at BB Founders on all platforms. Uh, you can also look us up at blackandbrownfounders.com. Um, you know, send us an email at hello at BB Founders um, if you have uh, bbfounders.co if you have any questions. We have several programs. One is called the Bootstrapping Bootcamp, uh, which is a 10-week uh, course that, that helps you go from your first idea to your first mm -hmm. paying customers. Um, and we always try to have events in which, you know, are affordable for people. Uh, and the, the bootcamp is no exception to that. We have scholarships available for people. So the scholarship form is online. You can fill it out. 
Um, it's important for us to be able to share the information that we have and to create community around that. Can, can we, before we go and dip, can we just talk about your poems? <laughs> your yeah, poetry? Yeah. I mean, it's a poeta. conference, so I, I think that's a fair question. Yeah, usually, I'm really ex- Usually I'm the one posing the questions here, Dell, but. No, I know. I'm excited. I'm excited because uh, I, I, and I'm excited that to have everybody hear your art because I didn't realize you were a poet. I mean, it does not surprise me. Uh, but I didn't realize that about you. And it was, it's, I'm just excited to have you share your work with our audience. Um, and it, it, I, it's just, I'm, 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 that's all I'm going to say. I'm excited. Estoy super, super emocionada. So, so let me, you know, provide a little context. And then if you have more questions about mm-hmm. that, I'll answer. So I've, I've been into writing since seventh grade. Mm-hmm. I got into to writing, particularly poetry, but I, you know, also write music, write rap and mm-hmm. you know, uh, other genres. But I got into it because in seventh grade, a friend of mine, Tuto, Jose Tuto Hernandez, mm-hmm. he got shot. Uh, mm-hmm. Lawrence Mass, where I'm from. Him and his cousin were walking home. He had a bite. Somebody tried to rob him for his bite wouldn't give it up, shot him. Wow. We ended up in the hospital, and while he was in the hospital, my basketball coach, Steve Kelly, asked me to write a poem for him. Now, I was just like, uh, okay, because I wasn't, I didn't see myself as a mm-hmm. poet a writer necessarily, but he saw something in me that at the yeah. time I see in myself. And that is what started me on my journey as a writer, because every time something tragic would happen then i i had this to turn to oh it's beautiful violence um not just when something tragic happened um and excuse me i'm pausing because i'm thinking about i got a friend uh lelvis olivero uh Mm -hmm. known known as brutus for the past several years Mm -hmm. he's from lawrence too and, and i hate to make this all sad but this is this is reality this is life so he just this story that I that I'm telling you is making me mm-hmm. think of him because he was just assaulted and murdered in Brazil a, oh, a, wow. a couple of days ago. And he's heavy on my mind because I think in many ways he's the type of person that we want at this conference that would benefit from this, that has mm-hmm. so many great ideas and created, you know was leading this podcast with eight mm-hmm. other people. They're like the wu Tang of podcasts. It's called Bring the Ruckus, uh, the Ruckus Podcast. And he's, he's a person who, since he was young, very deeply connected to, to culture and society and thinking about people and, and how politics works and, and uh, you know, addressing the inequities and whatnot. And so, Oftentimes, when I write, I write based on what's happening around me, based on the people that I've been connected to, uh, or people who experience the different things. I write from a, a deep and heavy place because I, I want people to feel the authenticity mm. in what they're sharing now from not just my stories, but other people's stories and experiences. And so now with with what I shared with Chroma, the the writing, the creativity and resilience, as you mentioned, that's always been with our people. That's always, you know, we've had to, right? As some means of survival. So even as I have ascended in my career, I, I've always had to maintain, yes, the resiliency, but also the creativity just to keep myself sane. Yep. One, of the, one of the things that I wrestled with for years was never feeling like I could fully be my artist self in, because of some of the roles that I occupied as an educator, particularly yeah, yeah, yeah. as a school leader. 
And to, to even further my point, particularly when I was leading in predominantly white and affluent schools. Mm -hmm. Why? Because I did not want them to see me. I did not want the population people I was managing, whether we're talking about students, parents, faculty, I did not want them to see me as artist first, as poet rapper first, and, and then like principal school leader second. Yeah, yeah. I had to establish my, right? Because I'm already stepping into the space. Yeah, yeah. And you know, people on the fence just from my very presence, right? Big, yeah. dark skinned man with locks. Mm -hmm. and, Basic voice, already a threat. Mm -hmm. Even even when I try to be as nice as possible, yeah, I'm already a threat. But when I try to hold you accountable, then you feel like I'm attacking. So mm -hmm. I've had to be so strategic, yeah, about how I navigate these spaces, how I show up, including uh, sacrificing to an extent my my artist self yeah. in the public way so that I can establish myself as school leader and make sure I gain the credibility first. Mm -hmm. And then once the credibility is established, then they're like, ah, I will gradually bring the artist out. Yeah. And now that I'm doing my own thing and we're focused on our business and multicultural classrooms, it's like, well, I could be artist all the time. <laughs> Because well, I'm I not that. about what everybody else is thinking and feeling and whatnot and how they go respond. Yeah. You know, I I can show up in, in the fullness of who I am. And so yeah. with, with the Chroma presentation, I wanted to share some real pieces that tie in, yes, the culture, but also mm -hmm. the tension, whether we're talking about the tension in the language and how, how you, you know, how others might interpret, like, you know, Am I, whatever, am I to this or to that? Or, you know, am I not, is my Spanish not strong enough for you? And, you know, mm -hmm. what does that mean about how you be? Or am I too black? Am I too, you know, all of those yeah, yeah, yeah. that, you know, sometimes they're, they're there, right? They exist, it's in the air, but we might not necessarily talk about and address it. it and when we do, we sometimes do it in superficial ways. And so I hope that people will feel that hear that experience that with the pieces that I shared yeah. you know, my portion of the promo presentation. No, I'm super excited that you said that. Um, and thank you for sharing that. And my condolences to you and the rest of his family and community. Um, wow. I think the, the thing that I, that I want to reflect back to you is that how lucky were you to have an educator that could help you access your feelings through mm -hmm. art? Like, that's like a beautiful thing. And I think about how often, unfortunately, art is one of the first things that's cut in schools, but it's actually one of the things that we most need, right? And that art and artists don't always have to look and feel in the ways that most commercial things need to look and feel. And that's so often that's what we're told, right? Like, oh, if you're going to make it, you have to be a rapper, Uh versus like there's 50 different other ways to be an artist. There's 150, there's millions of ways to be an artist and you just got to figure out the way that it works for you. Right. Um, and, and, and that I'm glad that having a business has given you that freedom to be your full self so that you don't have to be, uh, I, I think of it as like, you know, you're chopping parts of you off to be able to fit in the box. And you're like, at the end of the day, what we want is to be, this whole idea of like bring your full self to work. I'm like, that's, that's a luxury. Not a lot of people get, you know, you know? And so it's, that's one of the beauties of having your own business is that you attract the people who want to work with you and pay you what you're worth uh, based upon who you are. And the more authentic you are, the more real you are, the more you are able to show up, the better off you do. And that's so often when we're coming from uh, white predominant spaces and we try to emulate our white male counterparts in particular, it does not go well for us because what we're doing is replicating systems of, of oppression, one, but two, systems that weren't built for us. You know, that's why our tagline is rewrite the playbook because uh, the reality is most playbooks were not made for us to find success. 
Um, and I'm glad that a uh, multicultural classroom is finding success because it has people behind it who are showing up and saying, this is who we are, this is what we know how to do. And this is the kind of help we can give you. Uh, do you, do you, are you interested? Yes or no? Here's my fees. Let's go for it. Uh, and I think like there's something um, liberating about having a transaction be that like that versus like, how am I going to make sure that you're not threatened by my mere presence? Right. Right. Yes. Yes. Extremely liberating. Well, Del, thank you once again for your time. Thank you for your presence. Uh, folks, uh, one last time, the Chroma event is taking place October 14th through the 16th. Mm -hmm. Strongly encourage you to join. You know, we want you present so that you can reflect, so that you can connect, so that you can learn something new. Uh, so please, uh, take an opportunity to check it out for yourself, learn a little bit more about Black and Brown Fathers. Uh, you could go to our profile. We, we posted yesterday about the Chroma event. Uh, and yes. we'll talk again about it. So definitely check us out, or you can check out more information through Black and Brown Founders. But the Chroma event is accessible to you, to all, coming up October 14th through the 16th. And we're very grateful for, for Del Del Medina and her leadership with Black and Brown Founders, uh, all that she's doing in that space and beyond, and just for just being a great, uh, great individual who's looking to support um, folks like me, folks like Lorena, folks just like you. So yeah. feel free to reach out um, to her through Black and Brown Founders if you want to learn more about that organization or if you want to learn more about the Chrome event. I'm sure she'll be happy to connect with you. Del, thank you yes. once again. Gracias. Besos. Saludos a todos. And uh, thank you so much for being a part of Chroma. I'm really excited. As am I. See okay. You. Okay, cuídate. Chao. Adios.